You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, volume number 165 of Steiner's Collected Works, entitled Unifying Humanity Spiritually Through the Christ Impulse, 13 Lectures, translated by Christian von Arnhem. This is Lecture 10, given in Dornach on the 7th of January, 1916. I attempted yesterday, through certain pictorial presentations, to draw your attention to the great difference in the soul state of people in the fourth and the fifth post-Atlantean epoch, with us being in the latter. This is a difference to which people today in our present time indeed show little inclination to pay much attention. Let us just consider what an average person of the present who is, in quotes, clever, that is, who has taken in the prevailing fundamental ideas of the present time, might have to say about what we considered yesterday. He will say roughly the following. It is all well and good what the ancient Greeks developed in their imagination about the sequence of generations from Tantalus to Iphigenia, and it is all well and good the way that Iphigenia is placed in an aura of destiny at work. But none of it is more than imagination. That is the standpoint which is generally adopted by clever people today. Corridan, whom we have just seen in the Palatinate Shepherd's Play, does not say that right from the start, but Mops does say it. Quote, it's just imagination, close quote. But it is roughly the Mops, and in parentheses, apologies, standpoint with regard to these things. Now let us just look at how enormously convincing this point of view is for the people of our time. How impossible it is for people of our time to imagine that someone might step right into our midst who instead of providing information about such a personality, hereditary affliction, which I told you about yesterday, might produce something similar to the Iphigenia Tantalus myth. And if he did produce it, Everyone would say, would of course say, fiction. Everything is allowed in fiction, but it has no connection whatever with the truth, with real knowledge. And that basically is the point of view which people today adopt toward all of art. Current humanity wholly takes the point of view that truth can only be reached through concepts, through theories through such concepts, through such theories, which are taken from external physical reality. And everything else is simply fiction, however good. People in the present time cannot imagine that any other point of view is justified, or indeed possible at all, and that someone might take another view without actually being bonkers. Just imagine for a minute that someone were even just to suggest, I can dare to say it here, but am well aware that it is only possible to say it among us, just assume someone would hit on the idea of saying, in medical lecture theaters, there should be less talk of hereditary affliction and such like, and things should be clothed in something similar to a Greek myth. If the person concerned were to say that, as if he meant it seriously, and it was not a bad joke, then the least that would happen to him in the current culture is that he would be sent to an asylum. Anything else is hardly conceivable, is it? The conviction is firmly rooted in the present time that any other point of view is not possible from this one. Truth can only be found in the way that is officially approved and everything that human beings sought in earlier times through their soul was childishness was a myth, was fiction. It was not truth. But because we have finally come so, in quotes, magnificently far, we can also be certain, that is what contemporary people think, that souls in future periods of the earth 
will never see anything else as the concept of truth than what has just been explained. We can be quite certain of that. If we succeeded in the future in transforming airships into ether ships, and ether, as understood by physicists today, really existed in space, and a balloon was designed which sent some of our clever earth inhabitants, who were never so stupid as to join a spiritual scientific society, to Mars, and on Mars different opinions were to be revealed to those which have just been indicated, people would say, naturally, those Mars people are making it up. They have not yet understood how real truth can be found. That another perspective might be possible is a view which might also be taken seriously by a person who does not take the point of view of spiritual science. But then, if he is serious about that, he might well face a dreadful fate. One such person was Nietzsche, who attempted to apply a different measure and even berated truth in his book titled Beyond Good and Evil. But he meant the truth which alone is recognized by the present, and he wanted to assert a different standpoint, namely the standpoint of life, the standpoint of the life of the soul above everything else. He could not find access to spiritual science, and so he had to pay for his standpoint with his mental health. Another standpoint, for example, might be to ask, how do such concepts as are worked into the Greek myths work on the human soul? And how do such concepts as are worked into the present in the form of, quote, hereditary affliction, close quote, work on the human soul? How do these concepts work on the human soul, on the whole life of the human soul? What effect do they have? And there is indeed a huge difference. A person can summarize a number of generations, such as from Tantalus to Iphigenia in this way, be it from scratch, like Nietzsche, be it that he or she can believe in such a summary as something real. Anyone who can bring to life such ideas, the feelings associated with such ideas, in their soul, will bring a vitalizing element into their whole soul life. But those who only work with concepts such as hereditary affliction introduce a deadening element, a withering element. And this withering element is gradually effected under the influence of one-sided physical, biological, and so on knowledge. A withering, a deadening element. Never will this physical, chemical, or biological science of the present be able to produce anything that can contribute to the inward fulfillment of the life of the soul. Anyone who wants to can observe that even in outward things, try it, try it out, by the booklet titled Natur Philosophie, Natural Philosophy, by Oswald. It is published by Reclam. And try to get by with this booklet when you are seeking nourishment for your soul. See for yourself what an excellent chemist has to say about all kinds of aspects of nature, which is discussed over very many pages. But how what is intended to serve the soul is squashed into a few pages and is marshaled in such abstract terms that it cannot have any effect on the soul other than to make it wither. And development is not such that these biological, physical and chemical directions would contain any promise of providing food for the soul in the future. That is not the case at all. On the contrary, the further the individual sciences progress, the less will the less they will be able to offer anything which is similar in any way to food for the soul. And when the time comes in which the connection of the individual souls with the ancient religious ideas is completely broken, then souls will no longer have any nourishment. Then adult souls, perhaps one might for a little longer preach all kinds of things to children which one no longer believes oneself, then the souls of adults would just spend their day by starting with breakfast, slurping at the newspaper between each spoonful, 
but the newspapers will contain ever less of the spiritual goods of humanity, but more and more of the other. Then people will go to work and perform those of their duties which are necessary for the material supply of humanity. Then they will have lunch, will do something similar in the evening, and if there are people who have the time, they will kill it with amusements because it cannot be filled with any thoughts of any real value about a spiritual world. So what will they do in the evening? It might still be acceptable that people go to watch a play or something like that, which they don't really believe in anyway. Some will read a book, perhaps about such things which were produced in the, quote, in quotes, childlike stages of humanity, which were nice, but were produced like the paintings of Raphael or Michelangelo. And we can be quite clear in our minds. It might all be quite nice, but it has nothing whatever to do with values of reality. We should be under no illusion that our time is heading toward the withering and deadening of the life of the soul. If we now look at what the things I spoke about yesterday can teach us, we find that they contain something immensely bleak. Because what is the meaning of the rise of our fifth post-Atlantean epoch out of the fourth post-Atlantean epoch? The meaning resides in the fact that in the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, in the times of ancient Greece, for example, people were not as isolated in their souls as today that there was still an inner connection between the souls, but also that they still perceived this inner connection of souls in certain last remnants of visions, of inspirations from Diana, as they were conceived at the time, of inspirations from Diana, from Artemis, from what came up out of the unconscious depths of the soul. They really did appear to people in images, we can say that they still had a residue of inner visionary images about the connections between people, about life, and they took their guidance from them. It is quite nonsensical to believe that the Greeks would have invented something in the way we invent something like this in our time. It is quite nonsensical to believe that. When the Greeks undertook the Trojan campaign, and prepared for such a campaign, it would have been quite impossible for them to start such an undertaking for reasons which can be acquired through the intellect or are given life through the feelings, as happens today. They knew when they undertook something of that kind that they were placed in the greater context of humanity and the world, and that what had to live in their souls could not be anything connected with the ordinary feelings occurring on the physical plane. They saw the deeper reasons and applied them in imaginative perceptions. Certainly, they said, there was a competition between the three goddesses, Aphrodite, Hera, and Athena, and Paris was to be given the competition's prize, Helen. It was an image But in this image the Greeks felt and sensed great spiritual connections going through the world. People in our time may imagine that the Greeks went to war against Troy for similar motives as exist in the present time, and that then someone sat down and thought up the whole myth to explain the Trojan War poetically. That once again is to think of it in the external ideas of the present. The myth was seen in a vision. It was the imaginative perception of the deeper forces that were at work there. Now, I could, of course, if that did not distract us too much from the present task, explain how Helen was the representative, the imagination for the whole relationship between Greece and Asia Minor. How the whole competition between the three goddesses showed what the impulse of the Greek soul life was and how the Greek soul life had to work toward what it later represented in the world. But as I said, consideration of this myth would take us too far away from our present task. Let us consider this, that residues remained of a visionary clairvoyance which went by the truth of the images 
and that its poetic expression was not like it is today, where it is presented as something that has been thought up. It was a visionary experience, which then came to expression in outward forms, and which was not faced by a dry, pedantic, purely theoretical science, which would have been as proud of its concept of truth as the current theoretical science is. The connections between people were still looked at. That has been lost completely. It had to be lost because individualism had to arise. Human beings would never have arrived at the individualism for which the culture of the fifth post-Atlantean epoch has to be the teacher and which will gradually develop during the fifth post-Atlantean epoch. Human beings had to lose every last residue of the old clairvoyance to be completely removed, each one individually, from what can still be perceived of this connection. Human beings had to be constricted, we might say, in their soul experience with regard to their individual forms of existence on the physical plane. They had to be constricted. That could only happen if they lost everything that took them beyond their own body. They were complete, completely enclosed in their own body. If you have a vision of what connects you with other people, then you have a perception of the social life. Human beings in the fifth post-Atlantean epoch were not supposed to have that any longer. They were completely thrown back on what they can experience within their own skin. And that is how the first stage of the individualistic concept of human beings arose what we might call the most brutal stage, where in a certain sense they still are. If people today want to feel what they really are, the first thing they think of, whatever, their, whatever other nice theories they might have, is what is within their body, within their skin, really within their skin. It is difficult to get a clear idea of this in particular, because it is true and no one believes it in our time, because people like to develop all kinds of idealism to hide the fact that basically they only believe in themselves insofar as they are enclosed in their own skin. But this transition had to occur. It had to occur, because human beings gradually have to realize that in a certain sense and within certain limits, they have themselves prepared out of karma what is inside their skin. The thing which was Greek destiny was not not prepared by people themselves. It linked them with the sequence of the generations before them. What people will experience as their karma in the future will connect them consciously with other people. People will have to experience their karma consciously as something real. As you can easily imagine, experiencing their karma consciously is still incredibly difficult for people today. It is accepted in theory, but experiencing karma as something conscious, that really is still very difficult for people today. As I once said, let us assume that someone gives us a slap in the face. Outwardly, of course, insofar as we are enclosed in our body and our beings between birth and death, we have to defend ourselves against that. But a higher perspective has to be applied beyond that. Who was it that gave you the slap in the face? Who put the person who gave you the slap in the, in the face where he could do that? He would not be standing there if you had not put him there through the way you are connected with him through karma. Just think how incredibly difficult it is for people today to think that. Christians believe that they are people of the present, but truly very few of them follow the one who counsels them. If someone strikes you on the left cheek, turn the other one also. In thought, outwardly, it is not possible. People do not yet differentiate in this way between what is inward and what outward. It becomes incredibly difficult for them to live in karma in some way. And yet, as we enter life from the embryonic period through birth, 
through early childhood, then that which helps us to form our body is our karma. Between our last death and our present birth, we have gone through and have even taken an interest in going through how we should experience karma and what kind of body we should have so that we can live out our karma. In this way, we work on needing, in a manner of speaking, our body through the soul forces. Readers aside, needing here is spelled K-N-E-A-D-I-N-G, like kneading dough. I'll read that again. In this work, way, we work on needing, in a manner of speaking, our body through the soul forces. We even act in a localizing way, in that we place ourselves at the location in the world where we can live out our karma. We thus act on our personal destiny with the consciousness which we have between death and a new birth. That is the complete opposite of the Greek idea of destiny. But in order to reach that idea in a living way, human beings have to pass through individualism, have to grasp themselves as an individual in a very brutal way, I might say. And human beings are on the way to grasping themselves as individuals. But they have had to accept something, let me say, truly accept something for that, namely that they have to live out the experience. I am enclosed within my skin and my flesh. Human beings have had to accept something. It is that they became the slaves, the soul slaves of their physical body. They allowed themselves to be enslaved by their physical body, and the body, to begin with, became the ruler over a new believed destiny. And Iphigenia felt, at the age to which I referred yesterday, every single sentence in yesterday's account is correct. I roughly indicated how many years she still had to go to the age of twenty. And Iphigenia, who had visions going back as far as Tantalus, Visions which are today interpreted as reminiscences caused by heredity. Such an Iphigenia is no longer possible in that direct form today. An Iphigenia, who above all expresses in moral and ethical terms what lives in her family, right back to Tantalus, quote, Behold, I am of Tantalus's house, close quote, that is no longer possible today because today the physician will step up to her and explain hereditary affliction, your father, your mother, your grandfather, your grandmother, and so on, suffered from this and this condition, hereditary affliction, and that is the cause of everything. But that is an expression of the way the soul today wheezes along under the yoke of the physical body, wheezing also in perception, in its feeling. Basically, my dear friends, we can see the soul wheezing along under the physical body when we look at what has happened to the human being in respect of a certain world view of the 19th century. People only looked at the physical body and because they only looked at the physical body came to the conclusion that the human being originated from the animal world. Scientifically, too, Human beings are wheezing along under what ties them to their physical body. And it will hardly be easy to draw people's attention to what underlies this. Because people can come, if we draw their attention to all these things, and they can say, do you really believe you can refute the justified aspects of Darwinism? It has all been well proven. Certainly, it is well proven. It is indeed well proven. But that is not the issue. The issue is that our feeling for truth has changed. These things can be rigorously proven in the context of such a changed feeling for truth, naturally. We do have to be out of touch with today if we cannot experience what the issue is here. But all of these things have their practical consequences. Outer culture is steering with incredible vehemence toward implementing its thinking in practical life and no longer allowing the impulses of the soul and spirit to apply within practical life. And how close are we already today to applying such things, for example, in education, 
the methodology of teaching and upbringing? How close are we to applying them to the upbringing of small children? Just think what will happen when we get to the stage that not just the things are required which are required today of small children, but quite other things. When we get to the stage that once a child has reached a certain age, which will be determined by scientific statistical data, all parents will be obliged to have their child examined by a materialistic physician for his or her hereditary characteristics. In the meantime, the school system will have been divided into various streams, and after the medical examination by the materialistic physician, parents will have to put their child in this or that school, depending on his or her, in quotes, hereditary affliction, perhaps even into a specific kindergarten. Today people are still surprised when such a perspective is raised, but such surprise is the awful thing. We should not be at all surprised about these things, because if the form of Darwinism that is being theoretically espoused today were to become true, then it would have to be done like that. That is the key point. Then it would be the only way, and it would be unconscionable if people of people if they did not do it like that. The small matter might come up, the small matter that, let us say, someone might have hoodwinked the physician in some way, and the physician issued a certificate which is not correct in the view of others. But that is not their official job. Whereas the child should have been taken to Department 2, where there are certain hereditary afflictions. The child might have been taken to Department 5, where, according to the medical certificate, the future geniuses are. And then it might have turned out that the child was more clever than those who examined him or her. But that could then only happen through an error, in quotes. That something like that could be possible is no great surprise, is it? This is only intended to give you an impulse to obtain a view of the tendency which underlies the direction which is mostly still theoretical today. Today it only represents the globules of fat floating on the soup, but these globules of fat will keep growing in power. More and more materialistic fat will be added, and then in the end the whole bowel will be full of such materialistic fat, and humanity will have to spoon it up. But it is here that people will have to reach a point through a conception of the world as a result of which they will overcome the great dangers which lie in the practical implementation of the current theories. Once the content of our spiritual science has come inwardly to life in a great number of souls, then people in whose souls the spiritual scientific truths have inwardly come to life will not be persuaded by all kinds of talk about hereditary afflictions, but they will say, quote, However much you prove to me what was wrong with my father, my mother, my grandfather, my grandmother, and so on, I know that as well as what I carry in my hereditary impulses, I have a soul which has nothing to do with these hereditary impulses, because in the time in which the hereditary, the previous generation, was there, this soul was in the spiritual world, between death and my present birth. I carry these forces equally in me and we will see whether I will not defeat this hereditary affliction. True, for as long as people believe in the theory of heredity, and for as long as the truths of spiritual science do not pass into the flesh and blood, in that time it will not be possible to defeat heredity. It will only be possible to defeat it when the spiritual scientific concepts truly come to life in souls, and pass over into flesh and blood. But many other things still have to happen for that. We can certainly believe that the spiritual scientific truths will grow ever more persuasive for those who can comprehend them. But a number of other things will also have to happen. That is why I started today by presenting an aperçu about art. Consider how far what is called truth today has become distanced from art and literature since Greek times. 
how in the fifth post-Atlantean epoch a divide has arisen between what people call truth and what they call art. But this has a great deal to do with the attitude to art in general of current humanity. And here there is truly some value in taking a look at the way in which people today see art in general. There is one art in which, because it is primarily relevant for the fifth post-Atlantean period and its consequences, in which mistakes of world historical importance cannot be made, in which people are still forced today to look at the artistic element. That is music. In music alone are people today inclined to recognize the artistic element because they are forced through the nature of music to see it as more than a reflection of external reality. Because the artistic element can only be misconstrued in the furthest reaches of what is musical. If someone tried here or there only to listen, to see whether music was imitating the rushing of waves or the whispering of the wind or something similar, we would know that what imitates the rushing of waves or the whispering of the wind or something similar is only of minor importance in music, that something quite different is of importance, namely the inner structure, which in reality cannot be observed outwardly on the physical plane. Thus music is protected through its inner nature from being drawn too deeply into the tendencies of the fifth post-Atlantean epoch. The present time has less facility for poetry. There things can occur which lead from the artistic into the non-artistic, and in some fields of poetry these things occur particularly strongly. How many people today can still have a real feeling for the artistic in poetry, in the way that we have to have a feeling for the artistic in music? Most people, when faced with something, ask, does it accord with this or that model in reality out there? Indeed, we have a whole art of naturalism which judges all poetry only by whether it accords with outer physical reality whereas it is an irrelevance in poetry whether something accords with outer physical reality. It is just as little value in a poem whether a person in it is drawn accurately in an outer physical sense as it does whether a musical work imitates the roar of the wind or the play of the waves. So that we can say that current humanity has less of a facility for poetry than for music. In short, it is not important whether I describe something in four verses, which accords with some reality or other, but it is important how the second verse arises from the first, the third from the second, and so on. In a sonnet, the important thing is not to express something or other, but how the four and four, three and three lines intertwine. The four lines, how are they intertwined? What inner impulses live in them, like melodies or harmonies, but here transferred into the sphere of mental images, the field of sounds? There is, a, there is very little feeling for that. A woman, a very intellectual and witty woman, once handed me a novella. This happened a long time ago, about thirty years ago, and asked me to read the novella, and I'd tell her and tell her what I thought about it. This novella was of a nature, she was a very intellectual and witty woman, that something was recounted in the way that we tell an outer event, so that I was forced to say, the whole thing requires that you give it a structure, that you work out three novelistic stanzas, as it were, a first novelistic stanza, I was speaking metaphorically, a second and third one, and that there is an inner framework, an inner structure of an artistic kind. You should have seen the face of the lady concerned. How dare I ask for something like that? What? she asked. I should create three stanzas? That was her ironic response to my suggestion. Then the next art, for which current humanity has even less of a facility, is painting. Painting, as it arises from form and color, as it must look at the artistic element, and not at how what is depicted accords with some external physical reality or other. There can also be something artistic in a physical similarity, 
for example in portraiture or similar things. But then something quite different is important from creating a pure replica. Then it is important that the artistic element comes out through the way that the subject is treated, and terribly little of that is present in humanity at the moment. What people judge first in painting today can be compared with comparing the form of a melody, or such like in music, with something outward in nature. The descent from music to poetry is also noticeable in another way, can be noticed in another way in the present time. Someone may consider themselves to be a musical genius, but they still have to learn something, whereas poetical geniuses today consider it as something quite terrible if they are meant to have learned something about the finer aspects of technique. And there is also a similar tendency with regard to painting and such like. But we descend even further in respect of the understanding of people in our time when we turn to sculpture. Almost nothing else is considered here when people make their judgments than what would result if a sequence of tones was heard and they then spent the whole night searching for the natural phenomena to which it accords. Most judgments which are made about sculpture are actually of this kind. And we can see particularly in sculpture that an understanding of sculpture will only occur when spiritual science can be sought in the human personality in a living way. You will recall some of the things which I spoke about here and intentionally had to speak about here, about the way we can feel our way into space upward and downward, to the left and right, backward and forward. You will recall everything we examined. You will recall my examination of the left and right side of the human being and remember how much that can be developed. The experience of the human etheric body which is the thing that structures the physical forms, an experience which the Greeks had instinctively and which has been lost in the fifth post-Atlantean epoch and has to arise anew. We can truly say the time has to come in which sculpture will be grasped in such a way that everything will be abandoned which today makes people reach their judgment and everything will be applied which people today only bother about with regard to music let alone in architecture. Because if people today were not forced to put their chairs somewhere in a room next to a table and required to put a shelter around that, and if they were not forced somehow to enter a room and look outside, then today we would be totally incapable of finding the forms which in any way indicate architectural design. Because what do architects actually do? They study Renaissance forms classical forms, that is. They imitate because you cannot simply put up mere cubic shapes or polyhedral or similar cartons or boxes. Whether or not architecture will once again be able to give birth to forms will depend entirely on whether people will learn to experience again how the creativity of the world flows into the forms, because that had to be lost in the time of individualism. And so it is necessary to bring that back to life. It is necessary that what should bring life back into the ideas of the human soul is supplemented by an understanding of the artistic, that the artistic plays an essential part. That is why it is good that a number of our dear friends have not just heard theoretical lectures about art within our spiritual scientific endeavors, but were also actively involved in the creation of certain forms and other artistic things, even if what can arise in that way is only the beginning of something that belongs to the future. I must say, the last refuge which the people of the present world conception have chosen is what they call, quote, reason informed by outer experience, close quote. People have built the current materialistic world conception with such reason informed by outer experience, and the purely mechanical and biological, physical and chemical concepts are increasingly intended to determine our world conception. 
There is no inclination to go into the extent to which these concepts are filled with life, the way in which they can vitalize the soul. I have expressly emphasized that the great progress brought about by scientific research must be recognized by our spiritual science, that we should not expose and embarrass ourselves by constantly ranting against scientific progress. Furthermore, we will only rant against it for as long as we do not know it. When we get to know it, we will see some impressive results, and we should really let ourselves be told that we should not rant against science because we belong to spiritual science if we have no understanding of any kind of a single science. But we should take another look at the philosophical values in current science, or rather the way in which the current scientific concepts can become important philosophical values. We live in a difficult, a sad time today. We see the infinitely sad way in which death covers great swaths of territory. We see how pain and sorrow are spreading, an image which every soul today should face up to. It is particularly sad in our present time when souls look away from the great world events and concern themselves with their own personal affairs to such an extent. From this perspective, my dear friends, it caused me infinite sorrow, for example, in the last year, that so much of a personal nature came to light, particularly in our ranks, in a time in which the great interests of humanity could approach our souls in such an intensive way. But I do not want to talk about those things at all. I just want to draw your attention to them. How do people of the present time face up to such overwhelming contemporary events? There are those people who say, quote, Are we not aware to such an extent of the transient nature of the physical, particularly in this time in which thousands and thousands of deaths are occurring across the earth, that human beings have to bring to life within themselves what can arise as an idea of the eternal powers of the human soul? Are not these events in particular appropriate for guiding human thoughts toward the eternal powers of the human soul? Close quote. And so we might think that perhaps someone who was already very inclined to surrender completely to Araman, that is to materialism, might be urged by the power of the current impression of transient superficiality, of the withering of all that is transient, to turn their gaze to the eternal. We might think that. But let us look at some of the things which happen in reality. Let us take one of the most excellent scientific people of the present and his world conception. Let us take Ernst Haeckel. What is the approximate content of Ernst Haeckel's quote, idea of eternity? Close quote? He says, We can see in the present time how innumerable innumerable people are going through death, how an inexplicable destiny is breaking into the physical earth life of human beings. I say these, these things now in our words. Can we not see from that the absence of any meaning in the idea of the eternity of the human soul when we see how human beings can simply be mown down like that? Is that not proof that the scientific worldview is correct when it says there is nothing which has meaning beyond purely physical corporeality? Is what we are experiencing now not proof that those are wrong who speak about an eternal human soul? We cannot say that someone made aware on the basis of contemporary events of the forces of eternity in the human soul would be more logical than someone who says, quote, we can see people dying through what I can only describe as chance. How can I believe that there is real meaning in human development or that there are eternal values? Close quote. We cannot, from a contemporary perspective, say that the one is more logical than the other. You cannot find the one thought logical and the other one illogical if you apply logic seriously to your considerations. Because anyone who argues like that reminds us of what lies in current scientific achievements. We can truly, infinitely admire them. We can say, 
What magnificent things have been achieved by this science of chemistry, by this science of mechanics? It has perhaps achieved wonderful things when it is a matter of a contribution to human progress, but it has used its wonderful achievements equally to create very brilliantly terrible instruments of murder. The one thing is just as possible in this science as the other. This science can be completely neutral. It can produce the most wonderful instruments for investigating the secrets of nature and by the same achievements the most terrible instruments of murder. That is what this science as such is like. It can prove out of shocking events that human souls are more transient, but also that these events specifically show it can prove that equally well, that the human soul is only transient. This science is completely neutral. Something positive has to come. The message, the news, the revelation of the spiritual worlds has to come and these spiritual worlds must work through their inner power. You know that what comes through revelation is not in contradiction but in harmony, precisely with the achievements of science, but it cannot come from the latter. That is why those who claim that scientific concepts can lead to a satisfactory world conception are talking nonsense. Scientific concepts have to be supplemented with spiritual research. And that is the path by which we can get out of the great dangers of the present time. We have to see that the path of decline is the one which is associated with the greatest progress and that the ascending path is the one which has to come from the revelation of spiritual life. In this fact of world events alone, we have to be completely radical. That is what matters. Only spiritual science will be in a position to say something in turn about more profound secrets. Truly, my dear friends, it is not easy for an understanding of karma to enter souls. That will only happen when a larger number of people is in a position to grasp the narrowness of such concepts as hereditary affliction, the invalidity and unproductiveness of such concepts and to look at what lives in souls. Then when people come and see a child of which the physical physician has said, quote, it manifests like this, but nothing can be done about it, because the father was like this, the mother was like this, the grandfather was like this, the grandmother was like this, close quote, and so on. We have to be resigned to that. If that is what the physical physician says, then people have to learn to sense that it can also be true that there is a soul contained within, that a soul which is prepared for quite different things from what the physical physician believes on the basis of heredity, for something quite different between the previous death and a new birth, and that, above all, those things must not be allowed to lie fallow, but that these forces must be developed. These spiritual findings must find a voice in the world so that we will experience it as unconscionable if we fail to look at the soul and spiritual aspect. It will have to be understood that these spiritual characteristics will remain latent if they are not left, if they are left out of consideration in education. Because at a certain age the physical side has come to full expression and the spirit can no longer penetrate it, and then it will remain lying fallow for the rest of the incarnation concerned, something that should have been noticed. This is where spiritual science acquires practical importance. This is what we would wish for, that this practical meaning is understood. These are the things which I wanted to place before your souls still in connection with what we said yesterday. The end of Lecture 10